All right, hey gang. So I'm coming to you from Portland, Maine. Just got a, <laughs> checked into the hotel. Uh, earlier today, we were in Boston, um, day two in Boston actually. So yesterday we were at Operations Calling at Tulips HQ. Today we were at uh, Digital Factory 2023 in downtown Boston. Um, what I wanted, I, I wanted to get my, my thoughts out, okay, and my assessment of what we saw. We were only there about four hours at uh, Digital Factory 2023. Basically, the lay of the land was it was a big warehouse. Um, the whole reason that I agreed to go was because uh, Nathan Linder, who is the CEO at Tulip, was going to be doing a fireside chat with Blake Murray, who is the CEO of Rockwell. I'm going to get to my thoughts on that conversation. Uh, here in a second, but I wanted to tell you some of the things that we saw at Digital Factory 2023 that I thought were amazing, that were just really, really impressive. Um, number one is this company, Landing AI. Um, essentially, Landing AI uses vision technology and artificial intelligence to allow you to train models on many vision applications, but think non-conforming defects uh, for visual inspection. Um, while we've seen lots of technology like this, it's seamless integration through like Tulip apps is really, really impressive. And when I asked the, the cost, like how much would this cost at a station um, where we're using, you know, say I train, I classify three defects and I'm using a vision camera to do the visual inspection and landing AI is the platform that is identifying which defect it picks up or gives it a pass. And Tulip is the interface with the operator. When I asked how much would this cost, let's say you do 30,000 units in a month, it was like less than $1,000 a month. I mean, it was like $800 a month for the inspection, which is just, I mean, that's a ridiculous number considering the amount of horsepower that goes into artificial intelligence. So landing AI, definitely impressed with. Uh, number two, Zero Key, which is a product that I've actually reviewed back in Dallas. I haven't shot the video yet. Um, Zero Key is basically spatial intelligence. Again, showed another application where you can use the Zero Key technology to monitor uh, movement right down to one and a half millimeters. So you can actually create uh, go, no-go applications that, that literally would monitor whether a person had screwed in the screws in the, in the correct order, right? Which was pretty crazy. I mean, and, and again, the cost, incredibly inexpensive. Well, the big, the, the big theme here is short time to value and, and total cost of ownership is plummeting in certain arenas. I mean, the, the, the time to value that I'm talking about in these applications is just so unbelievably short. Obviously, the big one was um, Frontline Copilot, the, which is the the chat GPT integration for Tulip. Uh, Mason, who is the head of engineering at Tulip, was the one who did the demo for us. Absolutely crazy. Uh, the big thing is, is if you want to, right now that's going into beta. So if you want, if you are interested in being part of the beta program, we're gonna have a full review where I did the interview with Mason. You're gonna see that whole thing later. But if you wanna get signed up for the, the beta now from this video, go to copilot at tulip.co and say that you're interested in doing the beta. Um, absolute game changer. Let me, let me just put it this way. Many, many different applications, but the big one is essentially turning all people into data analysts by using ChatGPT to handle the definition and the retrieval of the data you're looking for, okay? Um, <clears throat> Form Labs and Tulip, this is kind of the big thing. So Form Labs is like a 3D printing company that focuses on um, circular uh, manufacturing. So uh, essentially natively integrating, in this case, to Autodesk Fusion, which I'm meh on Autodesk Fusion. I'll get to that here in a second. But I'm not meh on Form Labs. Um, the Form Labs and Tulip application. So basically, they did a pop-up pop manufacturing line where operators were manufacturing mice, computer mice, okay, four stations all with Tulip interfaces using one app deployed across the cells. We actually had Vaughn um, be the person who does the demo because Vaughn was an operations supervisor in manufacturing. We wanted the perspective of an actual operations person or an operations supervisor. 
at, you know, the fact that they were able, <laughs> the, the whole system was built in less than 40 man hours, okay? And you can deploy to all future cells in 10 minutes to one hour. And, and I strongly encourage you to watch that video uh, when we publish it to YouTube to hear Vaughn's take on it, and, you know, an absolute front, a frontline worker's take on it, okay? Um, let's get to the speech piece and then I'm gonna get to the fireside chat. All right, so in order, the CEO of Autodesk spoke about Autodesk Fusion, which is their new industry four platform, okay? I was not impressed uh, with his speech. I was not impressed with the language he used. He definitely, I mean, you know, he, he, he actually, his words, he wants Autodesk Fusion to be the single source of truth for all data and information in an organization. It was hyper PLM focused. So that is PLM would be the center of the universe. The truth is, is while PLM is important, the center of your universe is manufacturing. If you are a manufacturer, operations is the center of your universe. PLM is designed to support. You don't, inf you don't create rules in project life cycle, man product life cycle management that are enforced on the plant floor. You wanna know why? Because the moment those rules don't work, they get broken so that you can produce, okay? So your digital infrastructure must be a for reflection of the reality, whether we like it or not. Citizen developers on the edge are the ones who develop your, your digital infrastructure from the ground up, and then your PLM should be a reflection of that. That being said, I thought it was cool tech. So in terms of the technology, I actually was really quite impressed. But in terms of how the language he, he was using for go to market, he was trying to pander to people who are want to hear the buzzwords, AI, digital transformation, industry four. I was definitely not impressed. For, on all of these speeches, we were filming the speeches and I was wearing a mic and I'm basically commentating to our team. Here's what I think about that statement. Here's what I think about that statement. Um, okay, I like that, I don't like that, okay. The next speech, which I actually thought was the absolute best, was from the Formlabs CEO. And he gave an absolute masterclass in the history of material science. And he talked about all of the challenges that we're gonna face as we move towards contract manufacturing, specifically centered around 3D printing for now, and all the challenges we're gonna face because of the, the challenges or the issues we face with materials. So 3D printing is great for plastic, but it's not great for metal, right? So it was an absolute masterclass, incredibly valuable, valuable presentation. There was nothing vapid about his speech. There was nothing pandering about his speech. It was informative. It, 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 it was one where people would walk out of the room smarter than they came in, okay? Exceptional job. That's the way these keynote addresses should go. And now let's get to the fireside chat. So at the very end, um, at the, at very, we were only there four hours. So we left by like noon or whatever. So right before we left, uh, uh, Natin Linder, Nathan Linder, who is the CEO at Tulip, he essentially was interviewing Blake Moray, who is um, of the CEO of Rockwell Automation on stage, all right? Obviously, you guys know how I feel about Rockwell, but I, I was relatively open-minded during the speech. And let me just say this. I'm not gonna mince any words. The board of directors needs to file, fire Brett Blake. If I'm a shareholder and I heard that was Blake representing our organization, that he was representing our organization on that stage, I would be calling the board of directors and saying, get rid of this guy. You know, understanding Blake, I, I, I didn't know if the go-to-market strategy, the things that Rockwell does that frustrates so many of us in industrial automation and in industry four, if that was really strategic, or if it was a sort of a manifestation of many different variables. And I am absolutely convinced now, 100% without a doubt, it is strategic and it starts with Blake Moray. Um, here are some things that Blake talked about. He actually had the balls to say. The money, this is where people audibly laughed when he said this, at him, not with him, at him. People audibly laughed at him when he said one of his, one of the things that he doesn't like about the industry, he said, think about the arrogance it takes to be an organization who believes that they, they could be the sole solution provider for a manufacturer's digital transformation journey. Literally, people started laughing. Because it's just plain arrogant to think that one company can do it all, technology is really just another tool that we can use to do it all. 
fast, there's too much good ideas that are coming organically from all over. Because that is, he literally described Rockwell Automation. I, you know, at the end of the day, you know, he talked about partnerships. And he said, when you enter into a partnership with a, with a, when you create a strategic partner, um, there should be a reason why you partner with them. You know what? He's absolutely fucking right. There should be a reason, and it's called common values. Okay? What he meant was there should be a commercial reason. What he, what he, what he was speaking from was the relationship should be solely commercial. He never once talked about the operator. He never once talked about digital transformation starts at the edge and moves its way up. All he did was use high language. He, he essentially said nothing. At the end of the day, he essentially said nothing. This is a guy with an engineering degree from Georgia Tech who's been at Rockwell for 38 years who's never really been an engineer. He's a sales guy, and he runs the company like a business development guy. He literally moved to sales nearly immediately in his career. I, was, I, do, I wasn't expecting much, and I got even less than I expected. Um, at the end of the day, at the end of the day, Rockwell is going nowhere, and they are going nowhere fast. And here's why. This is the... This is all you need to hear at the, you know, all you really need to know. You know, when he was talking about the partnership thing, you know, one of the challenges that, or one of the things that frustrates me about Rockwell is Rockwell enters into these strategic commercial partnerships that are not based on values. And then Rockwell at, operates like the mafia. They basically twist your arm, they break your arm, they, you know, they lie, cheat, and steal, and I mean that metaphorically, to get you to do what it is you want, they want you to do. You know, from the way that they manage their account regions to the way that they manage, you know, um, uh, product code discounts to the way that they manage their services group to the way that they manage their go to market strategy when they're selling connected enterprise. The fact of the matter is, is Rockwell has been losing market share for the last it, almost nearly a decade. And they've in over the last three years, they've been trying to hide it through acquisition. So, or through partnership or acquisition. So you had the PTC partnership, then you had the Plex acquisition, and you had other acquisitions in there to try and hide from the shareholders the fact that they're losing mark share, okay? Get this. We are at a, we are at a, uh, a show called Digital Factory 2023. We have demonstrations of what digital transformation actually is. We have, di we have demonstrations of how to enable operators and workers to, to, to solve their problems with a platform that the business advocates for in service of solving the business's problems. And Blake was unable to give a single example of a successful digital transformation initiative using Rockwell products. I mean, never mind the fact that he never mentioned the operator at any point. Never, it never occurred to him that on the, on the, that manufacturing happens on the edge. He talked a lot about IT and his love of IT, believe me that, but never talked about the operator, but the big, the big money, the, 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 the thing that was clearly missing was that he didn't have a single fucking example. And if I sat on the board of directors at Rockwell, I would be appalled. I had good things to say about every speaker I had good things to say about every product I reviewed. I have absolutely nothing good to say about Blake Moray's representation of Rockwell Automation. And I am 100% convinced that under his leadership, they're going nowhere. Um, I had a great conversation. There was somebody who walked up to me um, at Digital Factory today, flagged me down, and said, hey, Walker, I, I, we had never met before. And he said, hey, I wanted to talk to you real quick. Thank you for your content. I got, this is probably the thing I got the most over the last couple of days, the comment I got the most. One of the things that I try to do in this content is try to, I try to say, I try to be honest and I try to, I try to give my honest, unfiltered opinion. I also try to express the frustration that I know many of you feel in this industry. And over the last couple of days, no fewer than two dozen different people, probably even more, um, Vaughn can probably, probably knows the exact number because he was with me the whole time, came up to me and thanked me for the content that we put out, but really thanked me for saying the things that everyone else thinks. I had multiple people tell me, I want to say what you say, but I can't. So I'm grateful that you say it. But I had a guy who came up to me today and um, he talked about a... 
a guy that we all know who is really big on OPCUA in Europe. And um, he, he used to work with this guy, and they were going head to head. And he was saying, listen, OPCUA doesn't scale. It's too verbose. <clears throat> you know, it, there's no way you're going to be able to build an infrastructure in here without uh, an infrastructure based on OPCUA that goes full stack to the cloud without it costing hundreds of millions of dollars total cost of ownership over five years because of just the how verbose OPCUA is. And when we shot the video that was being critical of this person, he shared it with him. And he was, he was trying to get him to come off the OPCUA kick. And they did, a, he told me their team was dissolved um, because of the choices, okay? And uh, that this other person made ar around OPCUA. And he was it was dissolved after they were, they unsuccessfully deployed an industry for our, industry for infrastructure based on OPCUA. When the infrastructure reached 30,000 data points, he told me the back end completely collapsed and the company killed the entire team. All the jobs that were cost, he, he literally, you know, verbatim, I, I'm gonna ask for permission to not necessarily share his name, but you know, basically reveal, I, I didn't get permission. And he did check to make sure I didn't have a mic on. And so I, I know he was telling me most of the story in confidence, I've, I haven't shared all of it. Um, but, I, but that part of the story, I think, is part of the story he's going to be comfortable with me sharing. Why am I so hard on these companies that advocate for technology and strategies that just don't work for manufacturers? Because it costs people jobs. When they're wrong, families get hurt. When they're wrong, communities get hurt. When they're wrong, nations and states get hurt. And at the end of the day, we have a duty we have a duty as engineers, as people who study optimal, to tell the truth, to ignore the commercial relationship and tell the truth. And that's why I do what I do, and that's why I thank you guys for supporting us. All right, thanks for watching. Look out for all the subsequent videos. We're gonna have long form of all the interviews we did, all the demos that we did. You should, you should have seen snippets of it in this video here. Uh, they should be coming out in the next week to two weeks. We'll, we'll gradually roll everything out. That also includes all the stuff that we did at Ops Calling, Operations Calling yesterday. Like, subscribe, comment down below, share this video with somebody who you think might be interested, and I'll see you in the next one. One fucking take again. Yes! <laughs>